church, we're so glad you're here. Let's all join together. joining us this morning. We're so glad you're here. Let's all watch this together. In the beginning of 2019, our community center had the vision to come up with a community garden. We partnered with the 4-H Youth Development Program and Blue Zones Project Fort Worth to make it happen. So in the fall of 2019, we got started on the art project. 
He built and raised garden beds, filled them with soil, and planted a bunch of vegetables. Our after school program students got the chance to taste the fruit or vegetables of their labor. Most of them liked them. When summer came, it was time to clean up the garden and get ready for the fall planting. A huge thanks to the Bear Valley Community Church, a youth group who came to help us out with the garden as a service project. They dug the new garden patch, painted the plants, put the soil, and added lots of wood chips. Our summer day camp students just planted a lot of pumpkins, so hopefully they'll be ready for jack-o'-lanterns at the end of October. Thanks to all our sponsors in the community for supporting our community garden. Thank you for joining us today, whether online or in person. My name is Julia Bauman, and I'm the Community Life Pastor, and we're just so glad to be worshiping with you today. Uh, we would love to connect with you. If you're here in person, you can fill out this communication card, and you can write prayer requests on the back or ask to sign up for different ministries. Um, if you are online with us, you can go to bearvalleychurch.com connect and fill everything out there. And if you're here in person, you can drop the card in the glass container at the back. Now it's time to worship, so please join with us and the worship team.
you pray with me, God? We come this morning and we um, turn our hearts and our minds and our focus and our attention completely and entirely on you. We pray that you would teach us more about who you are. Help us to grow in our faith. Help us, help us to be confident in, in the idea that you are faithful and that you are good. Remind us of your goodness today and of your grace. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Here we are on Mount Carmel. It's the location where the, the uh, prophet um, Elijah confronted the 450 priests of Baal. Baal had been uh, taking over, the worship of Baal had been taking over this part of Israel. And so finally, Elijah said, uh, it's got to stop. So he met up here on the top of this mountain. We have this incredible view where you can see for miles and miles, all the way across Israel, all the way to the Mediterranean. And here, he uh, asked the priests of Baal, let's put a bull out there and see if your God can burn it up. And I'll put mine over here and we'll see if the real God can burn it up. Obviously, nothing happened with Baal's uh, 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 sacrifice, but God burned up the other sacrifice. And that ended the worship of Baal in this area. It's an awesome place to be. And thank you for uh, joining us, whether you're here in person or joining us online. Uh, today, I'm here with Dr. Philip Webb. Once again, uh, we're going to wrap up this series, The Sacred World of Ancient Israel. So for the last couple weeks, we've been taking a look at uh, the, the worldview uh, of the ancient Israelites, the people who produced the Old Testament. Um, a couple weeks ago, we started by looking at creation. Uh, last week, we talked about the temple and Israelite places of worship. Uh, and today, we're going to uh, finish up by talking about the altar and the sacrificial system uh, and how that, that functioned for the ancient Israelites. Uh, but first, uh, we need to do, or maybe we don't need to do, we're going to do a little bit of shameless uh, self-promotion. So uh, if you uh, are interested in the sorts of things we've been talking about these last couple of weeks, uh, archaeology and the Bible and how they relate to one another, uh, Philip and I and a couple of your colleagues have been working for a while on a project called Beneath the Bible. So we're wanting to uh, become a great and accessible resource for information about how archaeology and the Bible relate to one another, how uh, understanding archaeology and cultural history can inform uh, our reading and our understanding of the Bible. Uh, and so, if you're interested in learning more, uh, our website is up and running now. It's beneaththebible.com. Uh, we al also have a few videos on YouTube with more on the way. You can search Beneath the Bible. Uh, and we're going to have a podcast as well where, where we can go a little more in depth uh, on the things that, that we're talking about. So uh, if archaeology and the Bible are of interest to you, or if you know somebody who might be interested, we hope you'll check out Beneath the Bible. Okay, end of shameless self-promotion. <laughs> uh, we are going to wrap up this series uh, talking about the altar uh, and how altars functioned in ancient Near Eastern worship. Uh, we'll start with the big idea of this series. You can follow along in your bulletin if you're here with us in person. Uh, so the big idea of this series is that ancient Israel is a people whose life and literature are a product of their time and culture, yet through whom God communicated timeless truth. Uh, and so kind of picking up on talking about uh, temples and places of worship, uh, from last week to today we'll talk about uh, altars, and you know, altars, um, you know, our, our worship today is not centered around offering sacrifices, and we'll, we'll talk at the end uh, about why that is for us as, as Christians, um, but that was really the, the center of worship for ancient Israel and for the, the neighboring people groups around them. So, Philip, would you share some with us about how altars functioned and how they were understood in the ancient Near East? Sure. So, in the ancient world, if you wanted to interact with the divine world, the sacred world, if you wanted to interact with the gods, the best place the, to do that was the altar. You uh, could have individual altars or uh, communal altars. They could be simply a rock or a mound of earth. They could be, the Israelites were commanded to make them of unhewn stones or just field stones. Mm -hmm. uh, they uh, also had uh, shaped altars, altars that had carved stone. Uh, there are, um, they range in size from small portable altars to gigantic uh, constructed altars. Uh, so these are where 
you would interact with the gods, um, both a, as an individual and as a community. Uh, in the ancient world, a lot of altars would have uh, what are called horns. Mm -hmm. um, so we have a picture of, of a horned altar. This is from Beersheba, a site in Israel. And this is actually an Israelite altar. Uh, you can tell the, the rough looking stones are the original and then it's been reconstructed, the, uh, the smoother looking rock. Uh, but the four little protrusions on the sides there, those are the horns of the altar. So in, in the Old Testament, when you hear the horns of my salvation or somebody grabbing the horns of the altar, which we'll talk about, this is, this is what they're talking about. These are the horns. Um, and so the altar is a representation of the deity and the horns play a, a kind of big part of that or a more uh, obvious part of that. So in the ancient world, um, in art and depictions of the gods, the gods have horns. Uh, that's the easiest way to identify a god in art. Uh, so here's a, we have a picture of the, the horned god. This was uh, found at a site in Cyprus called Enkemi. Uh, the Sea Peoples, which were a sort of enigmatic group of people, the Philistines were part of the Sea Peoples, they came, they destroyed the city of Enkemi, and the people there buried all of the important things, and this is one of the things they buried, this little bronze statue uh, called the horned god. And one of the other things they buried was the ingot god, who is standing next to him here. Uh, and both of these uh, figures have uh, horns, uh, sort of like, you know, Bugs Bunny Viking helmet horns. And um, the one, the, the ingot god he's standing on, uh, a copper ingot, this is how the Cypriots, uh, Cypriots mined copper, and so they put their god on copper, and he's very holding a, you know, a lance. This is often how the storm god, or Baal, was depicted. Uh, in Mesopotamia, they depict their horns a little bit differently. So we have a picture of what's called a Lamassu. This is a, a protective deity, but he is wearing a horned cap. He has this, that sort of conical or round looking helmet. And then there are three horns on it, and there are three on the other side. So these are less sticking out horns, but they're nevertheless horns. Um, and so in Mesopotamia, the more horns you had, the more divine you were. So there are some that have, you know, six, seven, eight sets of horns. So this one only has three sets of horns, so he's a lesser, lesser deity. Um, and this idea that the horns going on the altar, uh, there's a really cool depiction. Uh, this is from a Kaduru stone, which these are stones that were in Mesopotamia when they would uh, have a, tra a land transaction or a land sale. They would set up these boundary stones and put all kinds of depictions on it. So this is from one of those stones. It's an altar, uh, just a plain altar, and that has that horn cap on it. Mm -hmm. uh, that's, that's representing a, a, one of the greater gods because it has all those horns on it. Um, but so this sort of, I think, at least for me, helpful to show this mm -hmm. evolution of horns, then having the, the horned, you know, the representation of the god on it. Um, yeah. So you may be asking yourself, like, how did horns come to be associated with with deities or, or with, with right. representations of the gods. Yeah. So. so Yeah, so in the ancient world, the bull was associated usually with the, the head of the god or the king of the gods. Uh, and being a city boy, I this did not make a lot of sense to me, so I, I was doing more research. And the fertility aspect is often associated with the domesticated bull, but in the ancient world, they had a wild bull. Mm -hmm. uh, this is a species called the aurochs, which is now extinct. The last one was hunted uh, in the 1600s. Um, there are a lot of, there are a couple different rebreeding programs that are trying to reintroduce the aurochs for some reason. And this is a species of bull, of, of domesticated bull, that they're trying to uh, breed back the aurochs. And they, they don't have the size yet, that's not quite big enough, and they don't have the aggression. Uh, from all of our texts talking about uh, the aurochs, Julius Caesar talks about it, he says it was just under the size of an elephant, uh, it was renowned for its aggression, and this was the most powerful, the strongest creature on, in the wild. Uh, lions were no match for this. This is, the aurochs was the most powerful creature, and so uh, they, they take the most powerful thing that they see and they associate with the king of the gods. Even uh, in the oldest city that we've ever excavated uh, in, in, in Turkey, a site called Katsalhuyuk, there's a temple there, and in the temple is the skull of an aurochs. Mm -hmm. And these horns of the aurochs become associated with the most powerful divine being. And so uh, this, there's a very long tradition of, of the aurochs and the bull being associated with this. So the horns are, 
probably coming from that creature. Gotcha. Yeah, and then the aurochs, uh, we know the aurochs that show up in the Bible. Uh, in the King James Version, it talks about a unicorn. Um, that's, they're translating the aurochs as unicorn. This shows up in Job and in Deuteronomy and a number of the prophets. They talk about this creature. So we know that that's what they're talking about, and we, we just, it's extinct, so we don't have it around anymore. Yeah. Uh, it's yeah. good for us. Yeah. One thing I was reading this week is that uh, the Texas Longhorn, they've done genetic analysis, and the Texas Longhorn is descended from uh, a Middle Eastern aurochs and uh, an Indian species of aurochs. And so for those of you who revere Longhorns as divine beings, this, this may be why. <laughs> so uh, <laughs> this association goes back a long time. It does, back a long very time. long time. <laughs> yeah. Uh, there are some other, so, the, uh, so that's kind of how we get the, the imagery of the horns on the altar, um, and which is common to be in all, all the ancient Near East, yeah. including Israel. Um, and there are also some ways that altars function uh, as well. Could you tell us a little yeah. bit about how the altar functions? So the altars are understood as, one, as the representation of, of the gods, but also as the table from which the gods eat. Mm -hmm. uh, this is, the idea is that when you're sacrificing, what you're putting on, on the altar is for the gods to consume. Uh, and so whether this is, you know, a, an offering of, of an animal um, or a wine offering or an incense offering, this is going to the gods. So here this is from a Hittite seal from modern Turkey, and the seated figure there is uh, the warrior god, and the small figure there is a person, and they're bringing wine to give into, put into his cup, and then the person is bringing uh, a goat or something to feed to the gods. So this idea of feeding the gods is is we have representations of it, uh, and the altar is the place where you're putting food on their table. Mm -hmm. uh, and after in, uh, one of the flood narratives in Mesopotamia, the, the gods huddle around the altar like flies because they're going to consume what's on it. So mm -hmm. there, that's, that's a very well-established idea in the ancient world that, that the gods eat what's on the altar. Um, and then going along with that is the idea that this is the place of exchange. This is where anything you give to the gods is, goes on the altar, and it, it's this locus of exchange between the divine world and our world. Um, and this is a dangerous thing in the ancient world, that, that interaction between our world and the sacred world. It's, it's very dangerous, and you don't know what's going to happen. The gods are just like us. They're, they can be capricious, and you don't know what's going to happen when you rouse them. Uh, they could be sleeping. They could be doing other things that gods do. And so if you draw attention onto yourself, uh, you don't know what response you're going to get. Uh, so this is a, da a very, very dangerous thing to do. And so one of the things that you need is uh, priests to help you. So we have uh, um, we have an image at the, of uh, here you have the sun god Shamash. He's wearing that horned helmet. Again, you can see uh, he has the, the image of the sun in front of him. Uh, he's sitting on a throne. Um, going back to our creation talk, he, the bowls and the pillars of creation, these uh, mountains are associated. So that's this cosmic imagery going on here. And then there's a minor deity leading, or at the back, the, on the far left. So he has a horned cap, not as many horns as the sun god. And then the middle figure is the king, and he's being led by a priest because the priests are there to help mediate this exchange uh, between our world and the sacred world. And the priests are trained and they, they know how to handle this negotiation and they're the ones who help mediate this to, to minimize the danger that we have uh, when we go, or when, in the ancient world, when they would go to the gods. All right. Yeah. So that's kind of how, how altars functioned and you know, across the ancient Near East, this is their, the understanding of, of how they function. Um, but and there are you know, some of those ideas that the Israelites have in common, or that they adopt <laughs> as their own, um, and there are also some distinctive ways that the Israelites understand the function of the altar. So what are yeah. what are a couple of those? So one of, the, one of the ways the Israelites use altars is to commemorate interactions with God. When God reveals Himself, uh, oftentimes the Israelites will set up an altar. Or, or, um, so Abraham in Genesis 12, he sets up an altar. Uh, another one is Jacob, uh, the story of Jacob's ladder, where he falls asleep, and then he has this vision of angels descending. Um, and so what he does is he sets up an altar and calls it the place Bethel, or the house of God. Mm -hmm. um, so here we have a, a depiction of the temple, which is what's also understood as the house of God. Um, and at the Jerusalem temple, there were altars inside, uh, incense altars by the Holy Holies, and then in the courtyard, uh, the big A here, 
is, uh, this is the second temple. Uh, this is the altar where the burnt sacrifices would take place. So they, they did offer burnt sacrifices, all kinds of different sacrifices. You could make grain offerings and incense and wine and blood offerings. Um, so, so the Israelites would, one, you could set up a small altar to commemorate an interaction with God when God revealed himself. And then another um, important thing in the Israel understanding of altars is that what goes on the altar belongs to God. Um, and they, they share this uh, and with the ancient Near Eastern world, but you, you see it pretty uh, significantly in the Old Testament that what goes on the altar is God's, and what belongs to God you can't take. Yeah, um, yeah. and so, so one really significant example of this is the story of the sacrifice or the binding of, of Isaac. And so this comes from Genesis 22. Um, and so Abraham uh, is instructed by God to offer his son Isaac as a sacrifice to God. Um, you know, God gives Abraham the, the place and, and the method. And so Abraham and Isaac set off out into the wilderness to, to this place. And uh, Isaac doesn't know what's going on, but he's following his dad. Um, they get there, Abraham constructs the altar, uh, and that's, that's where we pick up here in Genesis 22. Uh, it says, when they reached the place God had told him about, Abraham built an altar there and arranged the wood on it. Uh, he bound his son Isaac and laid him on the altar on top of the wood. Then he reached out his hand and took the knife to slay his son. But the angel of the Lord called out to him from heaven, Abraham, Abraham, here I am, he replied. Do not lay a hand on the boy, he said. Do not do anything to him. Now I know that you fear God because you have not withheld from me your son, your only son. And so the understanding here is that in simply in the act of being placed on the altar, Isaac has been offered to God and now belongs to God without you know, kind of following through with, with his, his death. Yeah, he's, Isaac is put in that dangerous place sort of between our world and God. And, and Abraham putting him there is, in a sense, sacrificing him. He's saying he belongs to God. He's on the altar. At that point, he, he's God's. And, and God tells him, you don't have to do the blood offering with Isaac. And God provides the, the ram in the thicket to provide the blood offering. Yeah. Yeah. Um, another place we see this, uh, and this is a, a little bit by by inference, but uh, we, we see that the altar uh, is understood as a place of refuge as well. Uh, so from Exodus 21, uh, here's what God says. Uh, Anyone who strikes a person with a fatal blow is to be put to death. However, if it is not done intentionally, but God lets it happen, they are to flee to a place I will designate. But if anyone schemes and kills someone deliberately, that person is to be taken from my altar and put to death. So, so what exactly is going on here? Yeah, so there's uh, an idea that when, uh, if, you're if you do a crime unintentionally or if you're accused of a crime, you can go to the altar and to the horns of the altar and you can throw yourself on the altar, in a sense, throw yourself at the mercy of God. And you belong to God and, and if you have been uh, accused or if it was unintentional, uh, nobody can take you from God and you belong to God. But then there's this, this also if you are guilty and um, throw yourself at the mercy of God, then God will let you, will let justice occur. Uh, we see this in a number of uh, narrative accounts in 1 Kings 1, uh, when Solomon is crowned king, one of his rivals uh, throws himself on the altar and Solomon can't take him because he, he's on the altar and it's not right for Solomon to take what belongs to God. So there's in this idea of a horns of salvation of that you can be saved by going to the altar or saved from worldly threats. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, so, so there's some, some distinctive ways that Israelites understood altars to, to function. Uh, there are also, I think, uh, a couple, couple more important points to, to touch on. One is an understanding of, of how the gods sort of receive the offerings or receive the sacrifices uh, that the Israelites rejected compared to, to the other people who lived around them. Yeah, there's, there's really no sense that God is eating what's being offered to him. Um, there's the idea that the incense goes up to God, but we don't get any of the language that God is needs the food that's being offered to him. Mm -hmm. uh, the Mesopotamian creation accounts, the gods, uh, they don't want to make food, uh, and so they make man to make food for them. 
And so that's what humans are set out to do, is they have, they have to work and toil and make food for the gods. They are, in a sense, the slaves of the gods. And we don't get any hint of that in the Old Testament, that uh, God doesn't need people, and that sacrifice, the sacrificial system, is for God to be close to his people mm-hmm. and for us to get right with God. That's, that's what the sacrificial system is for, not to provide some need that God has. We're not meeting God's needs. We are, this is a way for us to, you know, for God to meet our needs in a sense. Yeah. Uh, so I think about, um, so the, the video we showed at, at the beginning, you know, Lee was at, at Mount Carmel where this contest takes place uh, between Elijah and the priests of Baal, uh, and they're each offering a sacrifice and, and praying for their God to, um, you know, to, to light the fire and to accept the sacrifice. Um, and so the, the priests of Baal go on for, for days trying to, to get this to, to happen, and Elijah taunts them with, with things like, you know, shout louder, he must be asleep, or, you know, and, you know they start, like, cutting themselves, trying to get Baal's attention. Um, and then when it's Elijah's turn, um, says, you know, the fire came from, God sent fire from heaven, and, and the word that's used there is consume, as if, as if it's sort of being eaten, which I think is an interesting inference, even though there's, there's not this, the Israelites didn't have that understanding of what was happening to the sacrifice, but, but the, the fire consumes both Elijah's sacrifice and the sacrifice to Baal. So in, in a sense, God's saying, you know, this, this <laughs> sacrifice is mine too. Um, you know, your God is is invalid um, and that you know all the uh, you know, both sacrifices belong to god yeah. and, and this contest between god and baal is, is a common theme in in the old testament that the baal was associated with the storm and he's associated with uh you know the mountain up a mountain up in syria mm-hmm. and uh god was also associated and Yahweh was associated with the storm we see this in psalm 29 and a number of other places and so this contest between what we understood in the sense of two gods who manifest in the storm. Um, and so it's this really profound sense of, you know, you're offering to two different storm gods, and it's you know, under, one way of understanding it. And God is saying, I am, <laughs> mm-hmm. this is all mine. I, right. It's only one. Yeah. 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 Uh, one other unique understanding that the Israelites had was r- related to, to the blood of, of, the, uh, of the offering. Right. Yeah. So the Israelites understood um, that life is in the blood, uh, that was it's clear when you read the old testament um it really first shows up in the story of noah after noah gets off the ark god makes a covenant with noah and he tells him um don't eat you can sacrifice but don't eat the blood because Mm -hmm. the lifeblood belongs to you know you can sacrifice something but the life of the sacrifice belongs to god you cannot take what belongs to god so the rest of the sacrifice can be consumed uh but you can't eat the blood Mm -hmm. Yeah, so in Genesis 9, we see this. Uh, so this is kind of the end of the story of Noah. Um, God says, but you must not eat meat that has its lifeblood still in it. And for your lifeblood, I will surely demand an accounting. I will demand an accounting from every animal. And from each human being, too, I will demand an accounting for the life of another human being. Whoever sheds human blood, by humans shall their blood be shed. For the image of, of God has... For in the image of God has God made mankind. Now, um, another place I, I think of, of this connection between life and, and blood is uh, the, the story of the murder of Abel by Cain. Uh, God uh, appeals to, uh, to Cain and, and says, you know, your brother's blood is crying out to me from the ground, almost as if you know, Abel's life, um, though his body is, is dead, it's almost as if his his life is still in the blood and is appealing for God's appealing justice. For justice yeah. yeah, yeah, and and we see this uh, again in Leviticus with uh, all these rituals or, or all the rules that you need to get close to God. That's really what Leviticus is: is God saying, "Here's how we can be close. Here's here's what I what you need to do so that we can be mm-hmm. uh, in communion with one another." Yeah. And in Leviticus, uh, when it's talking about the um, the sacrifice, the blood sacrifice, he again reiterates. Uh, you cannot take the lifeblood because that belongs to God. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. Yeah. yeah, so here, here in Leviticus 17, one of many examples uh, of, of this sort of principle at work, uh, God says, I will set my face against any Israelite or any foreigner residing among them 
who eats blood, and I will cut them off from the people. For the life of a creature is in the blood, and I have given it to you to make atonement for yourselves on the altar. It is the blood that makes atonement for one's life. Therefore, I say to the Israelites, none of you may eat blood, nor may any foreigner residing among you eat blood. Yeah, so this prohibition show, shows up again and again in, in the legal codes of, of the Old Testament. And, and the blood was used uh, in the Day of Atonement with the high mm-hmm. priest. He would go was one year, one day a year, the high priest would go into, into the Holy of Holies. This was understood as the throne of God, at the footstool of, of his throne. And they would offer blood as, as an atoning sacrifice yeah. on, on behalf of the people. Yeah. And again, kind of entering into that, that dangerous space between the divine and the profane yeah. realms. That there is a tradition that they would uh, tie a rope around the high priest's ankle um, and have it long enough so that if he were to die in there because he was in, in the presence God's presence, God. uh, they could pull him out and nobody else would would have to go in there. Yeah, I mean, when you look at Leviticus, all these regulations, they seem uh, so archaic to us. We don't, it's hard to understand, but it's mm-hmm. this, if you're going to come into the presence of holy God, you, you need to be, uh, have the right purity. Mm-hmm. And if you don't do it right, it, there's danger to you. And it's that, you know, we're going to pull him out if he dies. Right. If he didn't do something right, yep. um, there's that threat of danger uh, approaching God. Yeah, yeah. So, um, so that kind of leaves the, the big, question for us, you know, as, as Christians, we, we don't have sacrifice at the center of, of our worship. Uh, so what's the significance of sacrifice and of, of this altar imagery for us as Christians? Uh, well, I think the best place to go, if you really want to get a good understanding of this, is to, to just read, like, the whole book of Hebrews. You know, the author of Hebrews has this really, um, really intimate and, and detailed understanding of sacrificial system of the laws of the Old Testament, how they functioned, um, and draws, connects a lot of the dots between the Old Testament sacrificial system and the final work of, of Jesus in atoning for our sins. Uh, so we'll, we'll look at several places here in, in Hebrews uh, and also a couple other places in the New Testament to answer this question. Uh, what's the significance of the altar for Christians? Uh, well, first of all, uh, is to understand that Jesus is our high priest. Uh, there's two chapters there. Uh, I'll just read a short section from one of them that talk about Jesus as our high priest, as the one who, who enters into the most holy place and offers the atoning sacrifice uh, for our sins uh, before God. Uh, in Hebrews 4, it says, Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has ascended into heaven, Jesus the Son of God, let us hold firmly to the faith we profess. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to empathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet he did not sin. Let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence, so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. Uh, second, uh, the second thing to understand uh, is that Jesus, our high priest, um, has offered himself as the final sacrifice for sin. There was no need for, uh, to offer sacrifice for his own sins because he was blameless, uh, but Jesus has offered himself. Uh, in Hebrews 7, it says, Such a high priest truly meets our need, one who is holy, blameless, pure, set apart from sinners, exalted above the heavens. Unlike the other high priests, he does not need to offer sacrifices day after day, first for his own sins and then for the sins of the people. He sacrificed for their sins once for all when he offered himself. Uh, And then a little later, Hebrews 10.10 says, uh, And by that will, uh, the will of Jesus to offer himself, we have been made holy through the sacrifice of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. Uh, And so Jesus' offering of himself as the atoning sacrifice before God put put an end to the need for for any other sacrifice uh, that he offered himself once for all for for our sins, for the sins of of the whole world. Um, And that in in Jesus offering himself, it's the culmination. You know, this is what what the whole sacrificial system of the Old Testament was, was pointing toward, was Jesus ultimately offering his own life. Um, so that we could be reconciled to God. Um, And how about that? That brings us to our next point. 
uh, that we are reconciled to God through Jesus' sacrifice. Uh, Colossians 1, 19 and 20, uh, a couple of verses we looked at last week as well. Uh, Paul writes, For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. Uh, and so in Jesus, we have this, this reconciliation, this peace made between us and God that, that um, when we approach God through Jesus, our high priest, God no longer counts our sins against us because the blood of Jesus has covered over them and has washed them away. Um, and so finally, knowing what Jesus has done for us, knowing that his offering of himself once and for all creates this opportunity for, for this new and eternal relationship with God, what's our response? Well, Paul in Romans 12:1, uh, a verse you may know already, Paul picks up this imagery of the sacrifice of Isaac to show us what is our response to the atoning sacrifice of Jesus. Uh, and Paul says that now in response to the work of Jesus, we offer ourselves as living sacrifices. In Romans 12:1, Paul says, therefore I urge you brothers and sisters in view of God's mercy to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. And so our proper response, uh, really what Paul's saying here is the only appropriate response when we know all that Jesus has done for us is in a sense to, to lay our lives on the altar before God, to offer ourselves, um, knowing that, that we don't have to, to die, we don't have to offer our own life to be reconciled to God because Jesus has offered his life in our place. Um, and yet we live as those, like Isaac, I mean, imagine being Isaac and being this far away from the end of your life um, and then being spared having a sacrifice made in your place, and yet you've been placed on the altar. Your life now belongs to God. How do you live in response to that? Well, Paul tells us that we live each day as those whose lives have been, been placed before God, whose lives belong to God, whose lives are no longer our own because we come to God through Jesus. And with that... That kind of brings us to the end of this series. Philip, any final thoughts that you'd like to share? No, no. I'm out of time. Yeah, that's <laughs> I could talk and talk. But <laughs> could talk and talk. He, he could. Oh, we'll take him at his word. <laughs> and, and hopefully sometime we'll get to do this again. Um, but with that, uh, let's, let's pray. Uh, let's ask for, for God's help and, and thank him for the atoning sacrifice of Jesus. And let's ask God to help us live each day as those who belong to him. Our Father, we are grateful uh, that in Jesus you have come and you have done everything that was necessary for us to be reconciled to you, for us to be made right before you, for our sins to be washed away and covered by the blood of Jesus. We thank you for his sacrifice. We thank you for his example. Uh, we thank you that because Jesus offered himself for us, we can offer ourselves to you completely. We lay our lives in your hands. I pray that if there's anyone here in person or joining us online today who has not made that commitment, who has not placed their life before you to live each day as one who belongs to you, I pray that your spirit would lead them to do that today. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Thanks again for worshiping with us today. Again, we would love to connect with you, so fill out the communication card or go to bearvalleychurch.com slash connect. And as you know, we have so many ministries going on here at Bear Valley in person and virtually. And so if you would like to support the ministries of our church, you can go to bearvalleychurch.com slash give. Here are some exciting things coming up in the life of our church. Every year we do an event called Refresh and we give backpacks and school supplies and haircuts and eye exams to kids in need in Birdville ISD. And this year there is more need than ever. So we would love all of your support to purchase a backpack. And what you do is you donate $35 and that covers a backpack and all the supplies and the whole 
um, fun day for the kids. Now this year it's gonna be a drive-through and we also need some volunteers to help um, packing things in people's cars and greeting people. So please contact Kyle at bearvalleychurch.com if you're interested. And to purchase a backpack, you go online to refreshbisd.com and purchase it there. Um, we also have four Hayes apprentices coming to be with us this fall and spring and they are coming um, from all around the world to work with our youth and in our schools and we need four host homes so if you would like to host a Pace apprentice either they're part-time part of the year or full-time please also contact Kyle at bearvalleychurch.com to learn more about the ministries of our church and how we're serving people all over the world, you can go to bearvalleychurch.com or check us out on social media on Facebook and Instagram. Thank you for joining us this morning. Let's all sing one more song before we go.
you for joining us this morning. We hope you have a great week and we'll see you next